I want to talk to you today about a project that we've been working on for probably the last 10 years and it's sort of grown and morphed into what I've put together now as sort of the historical perspective. Um, the, the Great Marsh is located in the upper north shore so the red at the top there is more or less the New Hampshire boundary and the lower end where it starts to stick out by where the flames are is Cape Ann. So that's more or less where we are. Step one, and none of these steps are, um, they're all sort of concurrent. Um, we sort of fell upon this, worked, worked this out as we were moving along. But step one, if I were to do it all over again, once I've dis discovered what the problem was, you know, the invasive Phragmites, we would then create this Great Marsh Revitalization Task Force, which we did. Um, we put together five committees. There's more than 40 members of different organizations involved in this, all stakeholders of the Great Marsh concerned about invasive species. You can see the, the five different committees that we put together to try to ad address issues associated with what was coming up. The um, mission of the uh, revitalization task force is short term and long term and it includes number one the identification extent of the problem, uh, physical and chemical controls, those are both sort of short term goals, you know just trying to manage and maintain some sort of stability in the marsh and then uh, well, we, we also wanted to do some research looking at the root causes, what the problem, why is the Phragmites here and how do we get rid of it. We don't want to continue to be treating it decade after decade. And um, so we, we also needed some other additional uh, long-term solutions we were looking for. As you saw, the funding committee was a, was a committee and very important one at that. Um, money, uh, we couldn't do any of this without money. Um, and the sh you can see the short-term controls are fairly inexpensive even though they're not cheap. Um, mapping, herbicide treatments, um, et cetera, are um, fairly inexpensive and we found things from various state agencies such as DMF, DCR, Fish and Game, DAR, as well as federal. Um, one of the big federal sources was the North American Conservation Wetlands um, Act which Gave us, we, we applied three times and received three different allotments of funding. And then, of course, uh, about three years ago, we <clears throat> applied for Hurricane Sandy Resiliency Grant funding and received that. And that really went a long way to what we're doing here. And we've been, we've been working at that goal for um, multiple years to try to get some big sources of funding. So step two is the mapping and the treating of the invasive species. And as I said, we probably were doing some of this before we established the, uh, the revitalization task force, which is chaired actually by the two local senators for the Great Marsh region. Um, so we have, we have a lot of horsepower up there and a lot of the federal agencies that are involved in it as well as state and others. So a healthy salt marsh, most of you know what that looks like. A lot of patents some short form alternate floor pans and things of that nature. That's, that's what we should be looking at. Um, and we went from this, the upper slide, to the Phragmites in a relatively short period of time. We've been out, and when I say relatively short, over three decades maybe. Um, and it wasn't, the entire marsh was not looking like all Phragmites, but it was, uh, there was a lot out there. Typically, in the northern portion of the Great Marsh, you have a huge diversity of vegetation. Um, you can see here, it's not just Peyton's. There's uh, uh, goldenrod, there's juncus, all kinds. There's probably 50 varieties of plants. When in a typical, very healthy, non-diverse marsh, you might find you know eight or 10 species. So we knew we had some issues going on to begin with. And a lot of that is related to the salinities are much lower that allow some of these diverse plants. And it's not that a diverse marsh, marsh is bad, but it's a prime um, situation for invasives to come in. So the first thing we wanted to do was catalog um, what we had out there. Um, and so we mapped GPSed 
um, every single stand in the Great Marsh, and we mapped the entire Great Marsh. And you can see here what we were looking at, everything from large stands of Phragmites that might be uh, acre to two acre, three acres in size or even larger um, in the upper left. And then the near upper slide, the other near upper slide is what a medium density stand would look like. And then the lower two slides are what we call the low density or emergent uh, stand. And you can see those are, you know, you really have to be uh, hunting around to find those in the marsh. And we collected a lot of information about each stand, the ambient vegetation surrounding it, the tallest uh, three stems of the Phragmites, the density, the stand mature, maturity based on seed head presence or absence. We get a polygon of where the stand was and then you can see in that one slide where we'd mark the stand um, so that we wouldn't come back to it and map it again because uh, it's very difficult getting around in the marsh and you get lost often. We even, uh, at one point, because the mapping was so labor intensive, um, we, we got some funding to use pictometry, which is low elevation, oblique angle, high resolution photography, both um, true color and infrared, to see if we could map the Phragmites. And so we took a, a pilot area of uh, roughly 25 different stands, variety of situations, everything from stands that were partially under tree cover, stands that were very dense, stands that were near water, stands that were mixed in with other vegetation, stands that were mixed in with other vegetation of similar structure, so on and so forth, to see if we could save some, some funding and some time to map the uh, stands. This is what we found out. You can see in the, the, um, the left slide that green outline inside the red circle is the area of uh, a particular area of Phragmites. In the middle one, the infrared did not do such a good job, nor really did the, um, did the true color images either. What we found out from this process was that if the stand was a good sized stand, the methodology worked pretty well. But with a good size stand, you could take it off the fourth of photo. So this, this process did not really help us. And we had to go back to walking the marsh, every square inch of it, to find our Phragmites. Um, and you can see here what, what we found. Um, these are the areas where it is that the uh, Merrimack River um, is up in the northern end, just for reference. That's Plum Island uh, in front. And so there were what, two, four, six different locations where we had Phragmites. Fortunately, Essex Bay on down was fairly clear. This is section two, and this is typically what we did. And you can see the size of the, the circle is based on uh, the size of the stand. And then the density is, corresponds to the color there in the key. And what we found, for example, at this particular site was 325 or so stands in the 750 acres of that region. Um, over half were low density stands, were much shorter, about half the height. And then you can see in that uh, pie chart of vegetation, um, three quarters of the vegetation uh, around and within the stands was uh, box deciculus or juncus, um, which are more of a, uh, not terrestrial, but a high, high marsh vegetation. Whereas Payton's, which is that sort of yellowish, orangish color, is what you would typically be seeing there. You'd probably want that to be at least 75% in a healthy marsh. And you can see that it's only about 7%. And here's another section where, you know, they weren't all loaded with hundreds and hundreds of stands, but, uh, you know, maybe a couple of dozen in this, this area here. Overall, what we found was what you see here on this map where there are a couple of really important prolific areas of Phragmites, and then there were some where it wasn't so invasive. And as you move down the watershed and into the uh, lower part of the marsh, there isn't uh, Phragmites in the open marsh at all. At the same time uh, that we were mapping, we were also looking at ways to treat it. We were unfamiliar with what we were going to do at this point. Um, so we, we picked some pilot areas to go out and try to treat and see what happened. And um, we used backpack spraying, we used cut and drip, we used the uh, 
swab method to look at and see what the logistics were, how long it took, how much it cost, how effective it was. And you can see here that the cut and drip was extremely effective, super labor intensive. Uh, the backpack sprain was pretty effective for the smaller stands, but there would always be, for instance, in this situation where there's a stand on the other side of the creek and you couldn't reach it, you have to walk a quarter or half mile around to get to it, and maybe you didn't do that because you got to another stand before you did that. Very, very difficult um, and very labor intensive. We had a lot of, lot of large stands, so we had some more dynamic ways of dealing with them. And, you know, a lot of the property here is owned by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And they had used this vehicle here called the Marshmaster um, for some of their areas where they had tens and tens of acres of um, Phragmites. So we enlisted consultants that could use that. This vehicle floats so they can cross creeks, they can cross those drainage ditches very easily, and it was a much more effective way for getting at the larger stands. The smaller stands, the low density ones, which a lot of these larger ones turned into over the years after treating them, but also existed on their own, we would, we would get with backpack spraying. And again, it is fairly labor intensive, but that's really the only way you're gonna get at those. Before we could do any of the treatments though, we needed to get permissions. Um, and you can see it, that was not an, an easy process either, that the, the inset there with all those purple dots, those are all the Phragmite stands. This is in the southern Salisbury Marsh. On the larger map, I don't know whether you can see the yellow marks or the, the uh, lines, but that's the property boundaries. So not only did we get permission from the community, the, the municipal government, we would have to get it from individual landowners as well. Fortunately, we were able to, in all of the communities that we were working, get, we've got blanket permission from the community, from the uh, Conservation Commission to treat as long as we got permission from the, the private uh, property owners. And then once we had treated the Phragmites, we wanted to get rid of the standing dead so that next year when we came back to treat it again, you know, obviously the first one treatment is not going to kill it off. Even though it is growing in a, a stressed environment, um, it still takes, depending on what the salinities are that it's growing in, <clears throat> two or three or maybe even four years before you can wipe it out completely. So we wanted to get rid of the standing dead so that um, when you come back next year, you have easier access at the new vegetation that's growing up, as well as um, not wasting chemicals spraying dead Phragmite stands that are in, you know, that the new stems are within. Uh, at one point, we tried trying to remove the biomass rather than mowing with burning, which was um, very effective, as you can see in the lower photo. I mean, there was there was no biomass left at all, but it. Um, was again a, a lot of logistics involved in trying to do that. So you can see in these photos what, well number one what I'm talking about when you, when you see those stems in the, uh, on the slide on the right, you can see how much dead stuff is in the way and you might even miss it um, when you're walking through it. But also the point of this slide here is to show what comes back and how quickly. This is the next growing season, what you're seeing for um, for return. And here's some more slides. You can see the dead stems from the previous year, and you can see the vegetation that's coming back in. And here you see some up the top, some early season vegetation, and then what, what you'll find later in the season um, after it's had a full growing season to come back. As I mentioned, we had various different funding sources, and those funding sources you know, we might get some funding from DCR, and they wanted us, to, they gave us money to treat, you know, in and around the state reservation. So we weren't treating this particular area that you see on the slide. We were up on the other side of the Merrimack River. Or with a NACA grant, they wanted us treating some other areas, or DMF wanted us treating different areas. So we weren't treating the same locations year after year after year. I mean, we didn't have enough funding to treat everything, and we had specific uh, direction where the funders wanted us treating. So it made it very difficult to, um, you know, try to keep track of what you've treated and how, when it was treated and how often it was treated. And you can see in this slide that some years we did something, some other years we did others. This particular year 
was a NACA grant and we got to treat a lot of area which was kind of nice but it was very um, very piecemeal in our approach and when Sandy came along Hurricane Sandy money came along it allowed us to treat everything we didn't have to uh, we didn't have to discriminate as to where we were going to treat now the third step is as I mentioned we wanted to do um, we didn't want to be treating forever so we wanted to try to get into what what are, what's causing the Phragmites to be here and how can we change those conditions so that once we've treated it and gotten rid of it, it doesn't come back. So one of the projects we worked on was poor water salinities. We put out some, some transects in the marsh where we had clean marsh areas, where, meaning no Phragmites, um, and then Phragmites marsh. And we looked at the poor waters trying to see if there was what the salinity break was. And, and you probably can't see the numbers here, but they're mainly in the low teens to uh, low 20s. The red dots are Phragmites stands, the green is um, you know, native vegetation, and then there's a mixed vegetation as well. And you can see in this table here. It's not really important what the numbers are, other than the fact that we couldn't really, at least from this study, and we, we carried this out for uh, two or three years, uh, we couldn't come to any sort of conclusions as to what the salinities were that were really where the Phragmites was. I think that it actually, you know, adapts to the conditions it's in fairly quickly. Um, we also, through LIDAR, we looked at um, different thing, elevations to see if that made a difference. One thing we did find was that a break in slope and elevation was an area that Phragmites really liked for whatever reason. I'm not sure how that would help us in the treatments, but we were you know, just looking for anything that would help us out. This particular effort, the uh, EMI, the elect electromagnetic imaging, which collects salinity data as you walk along so you can contour um, the marsh. Um, and it allows you to, to cover large areas. You know what the salinities are. And the purpose of this was so that we could target areas where you know, if it was high salinity, we knew that even if there was a Phragmites stand there, it probably wasn't going to spread or expand. Um, if it was really low, it's almost like, you know, you have to treat that very frequently. But the, it was really the mid area, the sweet spot, where, you know, we really wanted to get at those stands. So we could target our limited funds at areas where um, we thought it would be doing the most good. And you can see we started mapping all these um, sections of the marsh looking for um, you know, some relationships between salinity and Phragmites. This is what we started to come up with. As I just mentioned, you know, the high areas, you know, even if there's a stand or two in it, it might not be that big a deal. You could probably wait a few years before you went back to that one. And, but there is a, certainly a sweet, sweet spot you know, from the mid-teens to the low 20s where of uh, parts per thousand that, that uh, um, Phragmites really is uh, prolific, and so um, we w that's, that's what we wanted to find out. And it was started to be very helpful. Sandy came along, and we didn't even need to do that, but I'll, we'll get back to that probably now that the Sandy funding is gone. We even um, looked at innovative ways to try to treat the uh, Phragmites, um, and this was a couple of different methodologies where we would with uh, some of the mowing equipment, we would drip the chemical onto the blade so that as soon as it cut, it injected the, um, the chemical into the fresh cut. And that way you're saving chemical and you're not getting it all over the place. Um, that was one method. We also looked at a, um, uh, a flail mower that cut and then a spray bar that would spray right into the, the fresh cut stem right after as well. Um, those sort of work, but not all that great. That was funded by uh, private entities that were uh, very interested in, in uh, Phragmites removal. Uh, we even put together a documentary. If anybody's interested, you can Google Danger in the Reeds. And it's like, I don't know, seven or eight different 10 minute documentaries really on what we were doing, different aspects of what we were doing. And then there's like a 10 minute summary of the whole process. But as I've mentioned a few times, Hurricane Sandy uh, Resiliency Grant, not only did it give us the funding to be able to treat all of the uh, stands in the Great Marsh, 
but it also allowed us to do a hydrodynamic model of the uh, Great Marsh as well. And that was something that we really wanted to look at what was going on with the salinities, where, where is the salinity coming from, you know, is the fresh water draining, is uh, salinity getting to where it needs to, to get to, and we com combined that with a sediment model so that we were looking at are there choke points in the river where the, the Plum Island River is, is filling in and not allowing the salt water to get up into the areas of the a um, whole lot of questions. That funding allowed us to do a couple of different things. One was the model on uh, outside on the erosion for Plum Island, which is unrelated to this talk, but also the salinity movement um, within the marsh as well as the sedimentation going on within the marsh. And you can see um, we focused on a few areas for that particular model that are in red, the, the Merrimack River estuary, Plum Island Turnpike Bridge, which we feel is extremely important. It's really a, a tidal restriction where the causeway that existed in the 70s, early 70s, uh, was uh, three, four, five hundred 500 feet wide, allowed water, salt water in and out, was restricted down to about 50 feet. And it was probably within a decade after that that we started seeing the Phragmites really start to grow in that, that section of the Great Marsh. And so we're in the throes of that right now, the modeling. We've, the model has been completed. We're doing some uh, scenario runs right now. Um, the Sandy Grant has, has been extended another year. So we're continuing to uh, find, try to find answers to those questions. Um, there were a lot of people involved in that. Boston University um, collected the data, and uh, Woods Hole Group um, is the one who is running the model for us. Here's Boston University collecting not only data for salinity but also for the sediment and erosion work. So to sum up the, the Phragmites component and then I real briefly want to talk about another invasive that we've been managing but we treated because of the Hurricane Sandy Grant 100 percent of the open marsh, high marsh Phragmites stands in 2015 and 2016. As I said We've made a lot of headway. We've cut it back, way, way back, the Phragmite stands to now where we're at more or less just sort of man management level or maintenance level, which we can pretty much handle with backpack spraying only. But as I said, we want to, it's going to take years before the recommendations that come out of the hydrodynamic modeling come up with some sort of, to implement some sort of whatever the recommendation is, you know, whether it's to put more, some culverts in the side of the bridge to allow more salt water in, dredge the Plum Island River where it's uh, impeding salt water flow from, whatever the recommendations, that's going to be at least a decade before that comes into play. So we need to be diligent and keep, you know, spraying, treating the Phragmites um, or it'll come back because we haven't, have yet to change the conditions of its growth. Uh, we also have another uh, invasive management project going on in the Great Marsh for perennial pepperweed, which is a fairly new invasive, probably been there about 15 years, just sort of getting a foothold into the marsh. So we've been going after that fairly religiously. And you can see here, as of last year, we've treated over 2,000 stands. We, had, we have 8,000 acres that are infested of the 25,000 acre Great Marsh. Again, because of the Hurricane Sandy funds, we treated um, essentially 100% of the pepperweed that we've mapped. <clears throat> Prior to Hurricane Sandy, much of the, the project here was volunteer. This particular invasive, you can pull and get, get much of the roots out. So we enlisted a lot of volunteers from all these different locations, a lot of school kids and such, to help with that. Uh, it wasn't until recently, fairly recently, that we've um, treated it with chemicals to, uh, to get rid of it. And you can see here the sort of the history of that particular program. The uh, red is sprayed and the green is pulled. You can see how much more in, in later years that we've taken care of this. I know you have pepperweed down in this area as well. 